Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson Chapter 3 I Make Acquaintance of My Uncle Presently there came a great rattling of chains and bolts, and the door was cautiously opened and shut to again behind me as soon as I had passed. Go into the kitchen and touch nothing, said the voice. And while the person of the house set himself to replacing the defenses of the door, I groped my way forward and entered the kitchen. The fire had burned up fairly bright and showed me the barest room I think I ever put my eyes on. Half a dozen dishes stood upon the shelves. The table was laid for supper with a bowl of porridge, a horn spoon, and a small cup of beer. Besides what I have named, there is not another thing in that great, stone-vaulted, empty chamber but lock-fast chests arranged along the wall and a corner cupboard with a padlock. As soon as the last chain was up, the man rejoined me. He was a mean, stooping, narrow-shouldered, clay-faced creature, and his age might have been anything between fifty and seventy. His nightcap was a flannel, and so was the nightgown that he wore, instead of coat and waistcoat, or his ragged shirt. He was long unshaved, but what most distressed and even daunted me, he would neither take his eyes away from me nor look me fairly in the face. What he was, whether by trade or birth, was more than I could fathom, but he seemed most like an old, unprofitable servingman who should have been left in charge of that big house upon board wages. "'Are ye shop set? he asked, glancing about the level of my knee. "'Can ye eat that drop, Perich? I said I feared it was his own supper. Oh, said he, I can do fine wanting it. I'll take the ale, though, for it slackens my cough. He drank the cup about half out, still keeping an eye upon me as he drank, and then suddenly held out his hand. Let's see the letter, said he. I told him the letter was from Mr. Balfour, and not for him. And who do you think I am, says he? Give me Alexander's letter. You know my father's name. Well, it would be strange if I didn't he returned, for he was my born brother, and little as he seemed to like either me or my house, or my good parish, I'm your born uncle, Davy, my man, and you my born nephew. So give us the letter, and sit down, and fill your kite. If I'd been some years younger, what with shame, weariness, and disappointment, I believe I'd burst into tears. As it was, I could find no words, neither black nor white, but handed him the letter, and sat down to the porridge, with as little appetite for meat as ever a young man had. Meanwhile, my uncle, stooping over the fire, turned the letter over and over with his hands. "'Do you ken what's in it?' he asked suddenly. "'Well, you see for yourself, sir,' said I, "'that the seal has not been broken.' "'Aye,' said he. "'But what brought you here?' "'Well, to give the letter,' said I. "'No,' says he cunningly. "'But you'll have had some hopes, no doubt.' Well, I confess, sir, said I, when I was told I had kinsfolk well to do, I did indeed indulge in the hope that they might help me in my life. But I am no beggar. I look for no favors at your hands, and I want none that are not freely given. For as poor as I appear, I have friends of my own that will blithe to help me. Hoot toot, said Uncle Ebenezer. Did I fly up in the snuff at me? Will a grief fine yet? And Davy, my man. If you're done with that bit of parish, I could just take sup of it myself. Aye, he continued, as soon as he'd ousted me from the stool and spoon. They're fine, wholesome food. They're grand food, porridge. He murmured a little grace to himself, and fell to. Well, your father was very fond of his meat, I mind. He was a hearty, if not a great eater. But as for me, I could never do more than pick at food. He took a pull at the small beer which probably reminded him of hospitable duties, for his next speech ran thus. Well, if you're dry, you'll find water behind the door. To this I returned no answer, standing stiffly on my two feet and looking down upon my uncle with mighty angry heart. He, on his part, continued to eat like a man under some pressure of time and to throw out little darting glances now at my shoes and now at my homespun stockings. Once only when he had ventured to look a little higher, our eyes met. And no thief taken with a hand in a man's pocket could have shown more lively signals of distress. Well, this set me in a muse, whether his timidity arose from too long a disuse of any human company. 
and whether perhaps upon a little trial it might pass off, and my uncle change into an altogether different man. Well, from this I was awakened by his sharp voice. "'Your father's been long dead?' he asked. Three weeks, sir,' said I. "'Oh, he was a secret man, Alexander. "'A secret, silent man,' he continued. "'He never said muckle when he was young. "'He'll never have spoken muckle of me?' "'I never knew, sir, till you told it me yourself that he had any brother.' "'Dear me, dear me,' said Ebenezer. "'Nor yet of the Shaws, I dare say.' "'Not so much as this name, sir,' said I. "'To think of that,' said he. "'A strange nature of a man.' For all that he seemed singularly satisfied. But whether with himself, or me, or with his conduct of my father's was more than I could read. Certainly, however, he seemed to be outgrowing that distaste or ill will that he'd conceived at first against my person. For presently he jumped up, came across the room behind me, and hit me a smack upon the shoulder. We'll agree fine yet, he cried. I'm just as glad I let you in. And now come away to your bed. To my surprise, he lit no lamp or candle, but set forth into the dark passage, groped his way, breathing deeply up a flight of steps, and paused before a door which he unlocked. I was close upon his heels, having stumbled after him as best I might, and then he bade me go in, for that was my chamber. Well, I did as he bid, but paused after a few steps and begged a light to go to bed with. <laughs> said Uncle Ebenezer, there's a fine moon! Well, neither moon nor star, sir, and pit mark, he said. Can I see the bed? Hoot toot, hoot toot, said he. Lights in a house is a thing I do not agree with. I'm unkafeared of fires. Good night to you, Davy, my man. And before I had time to add a further protest, he pulled the door to, and I heard him lock me in from the outside. Well, I did not know whether to laugh or cry. The room was cold as a well, and the bed when I found my way to it was damp as a peat hag. But, by good fortune, I had caught up my bundle and my plaid, and rolling myself in the ladder, I lay down upon the floor under lee of the big bedstead, and fell speedily asleep. With the first peep of day I opened my eyes to find myself in a great chamber, hung with stamped leather, furnished with fine embroidered furniture, and lit by three fair windows. Ten years ago, or perhaps twenty, it must have been as pleasant a room to lie down or to awaken as a man could wish but damp, dirt, and disuse, and the mice and spiders had done their worst since then. Many of the window panes besides were broken, and, indeed, this was so common a feature in that house that I believe my uncle was at some time have stood a siege from his indignant neighbors, perhaps with Janet Clouston at their head. Meanwhile, the sun was shining outside, and, being very cold in that miserable room, I knocked and shouted till my jailer came and let me out. He carried me to the back of the house where I was draw well, and told me to wash my face there if I wanted. And when that was done, I made the best of my own way back to the kitchen, where he'd lit the fire and was making the porridge. The table was laid with two bowls and two horn spoons, but the same single measure of small beer. Perhaps my eye rested on this particular with some surprise, and perhaps my uncle observed it, for he spoke up as if in answer to my thought, asking me if I'd like to drink ale for so he called it. I told him such was my habit, but not to put himself about. Now, now, said he, I'll deny you nothing in reason. He fetched another cup from the shelf, and then, to my great surprise, instead of drawing more beer, he poured an accurate half from one cup to the other. There was a kind of nobleness in this that took my breath away. If my uncle was certainly a miser, he was one of that thorough breed, that goes near to make the vice respectable. When he'd made an end of our meal, my Uncle Ebenezer unlocked a drawer, and drew out of it a clay pipe and a lump of tobacco, from which he cut one fill before he locked it up again. Then he sat down in the sun at one of the windows, and silently smoked. From time to time his eyes came co coasting around to me, and he shot out one of his questions. Once it was, And your mother? And when I told him that she too was dead, ay, she was a bonny lassie. And then after another long pause, where are these friends of yours? I told him they were different gentlemen of the name of Campbell, 
though indeed there was only one, and that the minister, that had ever taken the least note of me. But I began to think my uncle made too light of my position, and, finding myself all alone with him, I did not wish him to suppose me helpless. He seemed to turn this over in his mind, and then said, "'Davy, my man,' said he, "'you've come to the right bit when you came to your Uncle Ebenezer. "'I have a great notion of the family, and I mean to do the right by you. "'But while I'm taking a bit to think to myself of what's the best thing to put you to, "'whether the law, or the ministry, or maybe the army, "'what is what the boys are fondest of? "'I wouldn't at the Balfours be humbled before when a Highland Campbells. "'And I'll ask you to keep your tongue within your teeth. "'Nay letters, nay messages.' No kind of word to anybody, or else there's my door. Well, Uncle Ebenezer, said I, I've no manner of reason to suppose you mean anything but well by me. For all that, I would have to know that I have a pride of my own. It was by no will of mine that I came seeking you, and if you show me your door again, I'll take you at the word. He seemed grievously put out. Hoots toots, said he. Can canny mean can canny, bide a day or two. I'm no warlock to find a fortune for you in the bottom of a porridge bowl. But just you give me a day or two and say nothing to nobody, as sure as sure, and I'll do the right by you. Well, very well, said I. Enough said. If you want to help me, there's no doubt I'll be glad of it. But none, but I'll be grateful. It seemed to me, too soon, I dare say, that I was getting the upper hand of my uncle. And I began next to say that I must have the bed and bedclothes aired, and to put to sundry for nothing would make me sleep in such a pickle. "'Is this my house or yours?' said he in his keen voice, and then all of a sudden broke off. "'No, no,' said he. "'I didn't mean that. "'What's mine is yours, Davy, my man, "'and what's yours is mine. "'Blood's thicker than water, "'and there's nobody but you and me that ought the name.' And then on he rambled about the family and its ancient greatness, and his father that began to enlarge the house— and himself that stopped the building as a sinful waste, and this put in my head to give him Janet Clouston's message. The limmer, he cried. Twelve hundred and fifteen, that's every day since I had the limmer rope it. Da, David, I'll, I'll have her roasted on red peats before I'm by with it. A witch, a proclaimed witch. I'll laugh and see the session clerk. And with that he opened a chest and got out a very old and well-preserved blue coat and waistcoat, and a good enough beaver hat, both without lace. These he threw on anyway, and taking a staff from the cupboard, locked all up again, and was for setting out when a thought arrested him. Why can I leave you by yourself in the house, said he. I'll have to lock you out. The blood came to my face. Well, if you lock me out, I said, it'll be the last you'll see of me in friendship. He turned very pale and sucked his mouth in. Oh, this is no the way, he said, looking wickedly at the corner of the floor. This is no the way to win my favor, David. Sir, says I, with a proper reverence for your age and our common blood, I do not value your favor at a bottle's purchase. I was brought up to have a good conceit of myself, and if you were all the uncle and all the family I had in the world ten times over... I wouldn't buy your liking at such prices. Uncle Ebenezer went and looked out the window for a while. I could see him all trembling and twitching like a man with palsy. But when he turned around, he had a smile upon his face. Well, well, said he. We must bear and forbear. I'll no go. That's all that's to be said of it. Well, Uncle Ebenezer, I said. I can make nothing out of this. You use me like a thief. You hate to have me in this house. You let me see it every word and every minute. It's not possible that you can like me. And as for me, I've spoken to you as I've never thought to speak to any man. Why do you seek to keep me then? Let me go on back. Let me go back to the friends I have, and that like me. No, no. No, no, he said very earnestly. I like you fine. We'll agree fine yet. And for the honor of the house, I couldn't let you leave the way you came. Bide here quiet, there's a good lad. Just you bide here quiet a bit, and you'll find that we agree. Well, sir, said I, after I'd thought the matter out in silence. Well, I'll stay a while. It's more just I should be helped by my own blood than strangers. And if we don't agree, I'll do my best it shall be through no fault of mine. 